Well, good morning. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Andy, and to Maz for inviting me to talk at the FinCap conference, and more broadly to contribute to what is the ever burgeoning and ever more impressive FinCap week. Uh, I am the Member of Parliament for Hexham in Northumberland, what we call the True North. I am the guardian of Hadrian's Wall, obviously, and uh, it is good, as I always think uh, on these days, to be back in what we call the Southern Powerhouse. The, uh, I've spent a lot of time, as you'll discover, because uh, when I was setting up a community bank, coming to conferences exactly like this. And I am delighted now to be actually here, not only speaking to you about what government is trying to do on your behalf to address the agenda that I think we all espouse and believe in, but also to try and set out some of the nuts and bolts of what those things are. Uh, I got into politics quite late into life because, frankly, I wanted my country run in a better way. I am, for want of a better word, a one-nation liberal conservative, and I'm definitely not here to talk politics. If you want to vote Jeremy Corbyn and get Cuba without the sunshine, that, you're welcome to that. But I do most definitely uh, believe that before becoming a member of parliament, I had real-world experience. So I was a businessman. I was a lawyer, and I was a uh, National Hunt steeplechase jockey. At this particular point, when I say that, people then normally pick up their glasses and look more attentively and go, you look really quite fat to their neighbor. <laughs> and they then might also say things like, did he say steeplechase or cart horse? So it is true, I was a jockey. I um, uh, became no longer a jockey when I attempted to catch a horse as he fell at Stratford, uh, not something that I would advise when um, they weigh half a ton, and he broke 14 of my bones, gave me what's called a pneumothorax, popped a rib into my lung, cracked a couple of vertebrae, uh, cut my kidney in half, and uh, ruptured my spleen. I was quite good friends at the time with the greatest jockey uh, there's ever been, a man called Tony McCoy, uh, who did come up to me and say, do you have any other type of job? <laughs> so obviously I became a member of parliament. <laughs> um, the serious point is I am immensely proud of what we have achieved uh, under the coalition and under this government since 2010, whether it is raising the minimum tax threshold, whether it is creating the living wage, auto enrollment, which I'm gonna talk a bit, a bit about later on, 30 hours free childcare, enhanced funding for the NHS, two million apprenticeships or three million new jobs since 2010. Although I do accept, of course, that when we discuss the three million jobs, we have to accept that uh, George Osborne is responsible for six of them. The, um, the reality is, though, it was a genuine honour when the Prime Minister asked me to be, do the job of both being Minister for Pensions but also Financial Inclusions and to be the first Financial Inclusions Minister at what is clearly a critical time. It is something I wanted to do and something I'm utterly committed to doing. And I want to start with an unequivocal statement of intent. The reality is that for far too long, in my view, this country, uh, savings, investments, and pensions have been in retreat. We have done great work on, on auto-enrollment, but the downward trend prior to that has been very clear and I want to be a champion going forward for pensions and for savings. We need, quite simply, to get Britain to fall in love again with savings and investments, to grasp clearly that having money put away gives you options, not only to own a home, but to change a career, and also to survive life setbacks, and crucially, to provide better living standards in old age. This savings mission should inform marketing, capability, communication, and even product innovation. And keeping this savings challenge at the core of what is done will, I believe, serve consumers. And I believe we all should be of one voice. And I care passionately about financial capability. And I'll give you one specific example. When I became the Member of Parliament in 2010 in Hexham, it was patently obvious that we had a problem with payday lenders. And it was patently obvious that we had a difficulty with the withdrawal of banks from the high street. So we set up a uh, community bank in Northumberland that is fully regulated, uh, started from scratch with no government money whatsoever, and is now, following its launch by the Archbishop of York in November 2015, is now fully functioning and expanding at a rate of a couple of hundred percent a, a year. 
I'm no longer actively involved, but our community bank uh, has significant amounts of money deposited and is making low-cost loans to those who need them most. Now, I live in an area where Newcastle United used to be sponsored by Wonga. Now, they're a perfectly reputable company in many ways, but I don't believe that payday lenders is the way for forward. And so, as Justin Welby asked us to do, uh, we took on the payday lenders at source and made sure that there was community lending available in an alternative environment. But we then decided that wasn't quite enough. So you'll understand about uh, things like the Lifesavers Project. And the Lifesavers Project is run by the Treasury and by Virgin Money and by various other organizations to provide financial education and, crucially, capability to uh, first and primary school children uh, in their particular schools and it effectively is a bank in the local schools. It is something I'm immensely proud of, that the local bank I set up is now providing that on an ongoing basis. That surely is the way ahead. I want to focus today on two uh, particular things to discuss with you. The first is the single financial guidance body, and the second is pensions dashboard. But before I do so, I want to just give a little bit of context on some of our pensions reforms. Clearly, a key priority of the government is to increase saving for security in labor later life. We're helping uh, working people save for a private pension and giving them uh, pensions freedoms to access their pension savings in the best way for them. We've already made significant progress through a broad range of reforms, including helping people through, save for retirement through automatic enrollment so people can have a greater prospects with their retirement. The auto-enrollment has delivered probably the most significant change in pension savings of recent years. It has reversed the decline in workplace pension savings seen in the decade prior to its introduction. And bear in mind that uh, since 2012, when this was launched, 8.8 .8 million people have signed up to auto-enrollment. That is beyond the wildest hopes and dreams of any policy wonk, any minister, anybody in this room when this was first launched. And despite the growing success, we do actually know that there is more to be done. So, uh, we are currently doing the review of auto-enrolment, and myself and the Secretary of State will be uh, making specific decisions in uh, December this year and reporting back to Parliament. We're going to address fundamentally three areas. Existing coverage and how to achieve the right balance between enabling as many people as possible to save whilst ensuring that it makes economic sense for them to be included. As part of this, we're looking at the position of those in multiple jobs who are currently excluded from being automatically enrolled. We're also look, using the review to look at how the self-employed can be helped to save for their retirement following the Taylor report. Secondly, we're looking at how engagement can be improved so that savers have a stronger sense of personal ownership and are better enabled to maximize savings. And thirdly, we're strengthening the evidence base around contributions to support future decisions on contribution rates. We hope that the review will provide a clear sense of direction and will be the first step in an ongoing conversation between industry, employers and government about how we build on the excellent platform AE is delivering and how that then dovetails and relates to the financial capability of all of us. I want to add one particular rider though. I am passionate about auto-enrollment and fully committed to it, but I also want to make the case, much like we did with the living wage, which I helped pioneer um, a few years ago, that this is something that is good for employers as well as employees. So, taken together, I believe that the auto-enrollment and the new pension freedoms will help increasing numbers of people to build up pension savings and provide them with more choice about how to spend them. Now, I'd like to say a little bit more about financial inclusion, uh, which is the second half of my role. And as the first minister of that, I am delighted to have that opportunity to set out the case. I think we can all agree that access to useful and affordable financial services and products is utterly key. And I want people to have the tools they need to enable them to plan not only for later life, but more life more broadly. It is also important, however, that consumers are consistently engaged in decision making, protected from practices that are a threat and have a high degree of confidence that the financial system will work for them rather than the other way around. As many of you know, in 2016, the House of Lords appointed a select committee to consider financial exclusion and access to mainstream financial services. 
The government has carefully considered the committee's recommendations and recently published uh, its response. In our response, we proposed the creation of a financial inclusion policy forum, which will drive better coordination across government and with regulators and the sector in that space. We're pleased that the Financial Inclusion Commission recently issued a statement welcoming the government response as an indication that we are taking the issue of financial exclusion very, very seriously. Now, in relation to financial capability, I, I want to stress I support wholeheartedly the great work of the Financial Capability Board and MAS itself. They have clearly driven positive change and helped an understanding about how we can help people improve their capability. I was delighted to read the progress to date in the Financial Capability Strategy that has been circulated today. And a wide range of organizations are already involved in helping people to manage their money better, whether it is government bodies, commercial organizations, charitable foundations, or the voluntary sector. These organizations do amazing work and make a real difference to individuals' lives. I know many of you are here today. I've tried to speak to some of you uh, before the conference began, but I genuinely want to thank you for all of your efforts. So it is therefore crucial that the financial capability strategy aims to help people to improve their ability to manage money well, both day to day and through significant life events. Seeking to do so by supporting people to develop their financial skills and knowledge and by changing attitudes and motivations is surely the right approach. And I'm encouraged by the long-term approach of the strategy itself, which targets people at all stages of life. This type of long-term thinking is exactly what is needed and what we as government are trying to pioneer. I'm also impressed that the strategy brings together different people and organizations with different expertise and skills. This collaborative approach is surely critical in developing evidence-based solutions to the complex tasks of improving capability. I'm inspired by the range of organizations involved, and more particularly, I genuinely believe that the commitment and drive that has been shown over the last few years uh, is genuinely tackling the challenge. I want, in particular, to refer uh, to one particular element of the strategy, and it was referred to by Andy, but the research and evaluation on the What Works uh, Fund. I, I recently visited MAS, and I was particularly impressed by the What Works Fund and the work they're doing. This financial support for projects, uh, testing and piloting potential solutions, and evaluating financial capability interventions, and helping to boost best practice, is countrywide as well. This is not something just based down here. I think. There's been a great contribution by Maz in this and the other organizations who are helping. And step by step, I genuinely believe that they are accumulating an evidence base to build the picture of what works to increase capability for the people of this country. Now, for me, a major part of my new role since uh, July has been uh, to introduce the Financial Guidance and Claims Bill and manage its progress through Parliament. This bill provides for the establishment of a single financial guidance body. This was the first bill introduced by the government uh, since the general election. So if there is any doubt in your mind about whether the uh, government takes this seriously, the very first bill that they uh, set out is the Financial Guidance and Claims Bill. The um, uh, bill has now completed its report stage in the House of Lords. It began in the House of Lords with Baroness Buscombe, my colleague, leading it, and we expect third reading, which is the final stage, to take place on Tuesday the 21st of November. The bill will then be introduced to the House of Commons shortly after that and is on course, we hope, to receive the Queen's signature by March next year. There is a broad consensus, I believe, that a single body is the way forward for financial advice and guidance. It brings together and builds on the important work done by MAS, uh, TPAS and PensionWise. I've been speaking to all three of these organizations. And what genuinely struck me was the enthusiasm of all three organizations for the direction of travel and the merger of these three organizations to accentuate the many positive things that they are doing already. The new body will, I believe, be a single port of call for those seeking help, bringing money, debt, and pensions guidance together and offering a more holistic approach and a service to the consumers. 
It will make it genuinely easier for people to access the impartial help they need in making effective financial decisions and help plan and save for their future. And one of the key objectives, let us be clear, of the new single financial guidance body will be to help develop financial capability. Together, these three combined services will drive forward work on the financial capability strategy for the UK and to help everybody, whatever their age, to improve that capability. Through its strategic functions, uh, the SFGB will also bring together interested part parties and partners in the financial services industry, the public and voluntary sectors, and the devolved administrations with the aim of improving the ability of members to manage their finances. To deliver that, the body will need to develop a, and coordinate a national strategy to improve financial capability and people's ability to manage debt and financial education for children and young people. The premise of the strategy strategy is that one organization working independently will have little chance of greatly impacting cap financial capability, but many working together definitely will. The role of the new body will be to develop that framework, drive the process forward, and oversee implementation. I also then want to turn to the issue of the pensions dashboard, because as well as guidance, I believe Consumers need access to good information on their pensions. And this is, in my view, a long overdue reform. As recent research from the industry-led pensions dashboard project has suggested, in today's environment, when people struggle to find information about their pensions, they become frustrated, confused, and more. It is not surprising, then, that engagement levels are so low, that so many people are not saving enough, and that millions if not billions, worth of pensions pots have become lost in this antiquated system. Everyone agrees that the old way of doing things does not work for a lot of people. We now need to bring people up to match fitness so that they are in a position to make good decisions, have proper accessibility, and include uh, an advantage of the opportunities that the pension freedoms bring. That is why government has been working with industry and regulators on the development of the pensions dashboard which I believe presents a clear picture of a person's pension entitlement in one secure online location. I see the introduction of the dashboard as the catalyst that will genuinely transform the way in which people begin to think about retirement. <coughs> Through the pensions dashboard, people can have a clear picture of all the pension savings in one place. And bear in mind, the average person has, at the very least, 11 pots uh, at their disposal and they have accrued. This will undoubtedly help people make better decisions and make it easier for savers to plan ahead. I believe it is time, frankly, to bring pensions into the digital, digital age. I want to ensure that pensions information and the data that belongs to consumers is available when the, customer, con, and the consumer wants it to see in one specific place. And I believe that the dashboard, supported with clear signposting to quality and impartial uh, guidance will help to restore a belief in the pension system. People will, I believe, feel more in control and more confident as they are able to make better informed, accessible, transparent decisions. The evidence to support this is numerous. The recently published uh, consumer research carried out by 2CV on behalf of the industry supports this view. The industry project group managed by the ABI, which reported in October, has done great work in delivering a prototype infrastructure showing that the technology can work. We see this as a very big step forward, but we do now need to move to the next level. And I want to try and set out what those levels are today. As highlighted in the um, ABI's report, uh, there are a number of key areas to consider, including whether we need to compel schemes to participate and when that compulsion would or would not take place the governance arrangements, a model for delivery that will work for both industry and user, and discussions of all manner of data. I recently announced that the Department for Work and Pensions has taken lead responsibility for the project within government, away from Treasury and into DWP, and we are managing the next phase of the project. We have enhanced the team behind it, and we are working with industry, with consumers, and regulators and has commenced a feasibility study to examine the complex issues that still need to be addressed. But I do want to make the point that we want to move at 
relative pace. Clearly, we want to get it right, but I would do want to make progress. So, whilst I'm grateful to all the organizations involved in the project so far and who are working with us, we are holding a large number of stakeholder events, not least on the 11th of December, uh, in a matter of weeks' times, and we will publish a report on the findings of the feasibility study within approximately 12 weeks, so that uh, I can then make a statement setting out the pathway for how this will be delivered. But be in no doubt, the dashboard will happen. I also want to dovetail that onto one final thing that we in the department and I myself feel very passionately about, which is the midlife MOT. Um, I believe a midlife MOT can provide workers with a holistic advice to prepare for the gradual transition to retirement. I'd like to thank some of the organizations who are already pioneering this in the private sector, whether it is Aviva and others who are doing this as part of their HR. This is, in my opinion, a very, very promising idea and dovetails well with Dashboard and the other work we are doing. I certainly look forward to see, hearing how it is working. I'll give you one interesting example whereby I recently visited a uh, firm called Steelite in Stoke, which is a uh, pottery company. And there are about 600 workers. It was not the sort of place that you would imagine seeing an IFA. And as part of the provision by the company of effectively their HR, they laid on and provided a uh, IFA to advise the employees, such that they were then able to take individual decisions at particular times. That sort of approach, I think, is massively to be applauded in the private sector, but is surely also the way in which we should be traveling. I apologize at this stage because I'm not going to be able to stay for the rest of today's conference because I have to head back to Parliament to do a couple of debates. Um, I just want to make a couple of points on some of the things that you are going to be debating. I don't think you could be any doubt that Dashboard's going to happen. I know that you'll be discussing that later. I don't think you should be in any doubt that we want to make uh, savings and pensions more accessible and transparent. And I don't think you can be any doubt that the guidance body will provide and address many of the things that we all genuinely care passionately about. For my part, I'm absolutely determined that we help manage people to manage money better, both day to day and through significant life events, including retirement. And if we work together in that respect, I believe it is genuinely possible to make a difference. Thank you very much indeed.